Well, welcome to another CP Media podcast brought to you, of course, by uh, Team CP, your endurance coaching specialist. And tonight, Richard Greer, you are alongside me as always. Um, and tonight's show, Richard, brought to you by Giant Bikes NZ. We'd like to welcome them on board supporting our show tonight. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? They uh, just sent us a great big box of goodies last uh, Friday as part of our end of season wind up that we had. And we've got a, a bunch of stuff left over. So we're going to give some stuff out tonight with our Allen Key tools, there's drink bottles, there's all sorts of different bits and pieces in there. So we've got a bit of a, a prize pack to give away on behalf of Giant, which is pretty cool. And we love to give stuff away, don't we, really? So, so uh, again, same format as always, Richard. Tell us in a comment uh, on however you're watching this, whether you're watching this on our main Team CP page, on our community page, or you're watching this via YouTube, uh, drop us a comment on one thing that you've learned tonight, something you've taken away, a key takeaway from the night, eh? Yeah, absolutely, because that's effectively what our goal is of this podcast, is to go, what have we learned? To share some learning um, and uh, and spread that that awesomeness around So how to help you have a better job of your performance and enjoy your race day more. Exactly. And so while we're on it, last week's uh, show was brought to, uh, brought to you all out there by True Fleece Merino, mm-hmm. uh, a new... A new that, that's it. Look at that. And actually, as the seasons have changed, Richard, it's been great because I've been able to get some of my favourite True Fleece Merino uh, uh, warmer gear on. So I'm quite enjoying being able to break that out of the cupboard and, and get some wear out of that. Nice, um, nice, nice. So our winner from last week, uh, which was a True Fleece Merino neck warmer, goes to Grant Boyd. Now, Grant says the best thing for me was those hints on what to add various ingredients to boost the protein of a simple quick breakfast. So, of course, we had Kushla, Hol- uh, Kushla Jackson, she is now, uh, our, our CP nutritionist dietitian on our show again last week, and uh, we talked all things protein. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. And she's going to be back on tonight as well, uh, building upon some of those ideas around that protein. So uh, I had a number of comments about that during the last uh, week or so about those um, breakfast ideas and bits and pieces that she came up with. So she's going to have a bit of a chat to us later on to wrap up the show. Perfect. So again, don't forget, thanks to Giant Bikes NZ for sponsoring tonight's show. Uh, tell us what you've learned or tell us something that you've picked up from this show. Uh, put it in a comment and you will be in the drawer uh want to announce next week on next week's show yeah absolutely so um just as i mentioned there before giant bikes sent us a, a big box of different stuff to, to give out as part of our end of season wind up which we had first time in a couple of years that we've been able to do that a bit of a get together on friday night a uh, great crowd awesome to get to catch up with a whole bunch of people there was uh some more stories told and there's some adventures planned and we also gave out a bunch of awards as well for different people um excelling doing really well and uh maybe tripping up there's a bit of that as well or even just um i guess being part of our community so just running through some of those awards we've got a be awesome award the mark denford be awesome award was won by lee butts as a result of running his sub three hour marathon which is pretty awesome uh and most improved award went to darren sanford um for his uh buller marathon and running the an awesome half marathon really improving heaps our team cp community spirit award Goes went to Andrew Ludds Luddington. Um, hashtag love the Lutz. <laughs> so he's awesome. Uh, always Man, out there. Man's got his own hashtag. How cool! <laughs> and uh, and um, spreading spreading the awesomeness and just supporting lots of people doing their thing. Our Heart of Nails Award went to Sally Wright for um, for being an official at the top of the hill on Mount Oxford, basically during a snowstorm overnight. So uh, survived and and uh, helped everybody get through that event in one piece. The Custard Square Award went to Jamie Mountier for doing God's Own and his bike seat falling off. Now, now I noticed that was a two-pack of Custard Squares, Richard. Yes, it was. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, that's a, a Custard Square's best share, though, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. It was. I wasn't party to the sharing, so I couldn't I couldn't. <laughs> well, answer I bought that. them. It was a business expense. I was like, oh, we'll, we'll buy two. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and our True Grit Award uh, went to Beth Yagu. She we're going to have a chat to tonight as well on her um, on her training and racing and uh, fantastic performance and completing the longest day coast to coast earlier on this year, which is pretty awesome. So yeah, great to be able to get together and and um, I just just share some of those experiences and um, and uh, give some of those awards out. It was it was great to have that community based. Uh feeling again have everybody around we shared a beer we shared a pizza um we do all of those things uh shout out to jake vargo we didn't just share one beer we may have shared multiple um 
<laughs> along the way. Um, yeah, no, it was a it was a really good night, Richard, and so much positivity and everybody thinking about you know what they're going to do next, and that's the great thing is that we've we've ticked a heap of boxes, we've ticked off our big goal, but we haven't stopped there. We're now ready to look for that next one and uh, you know see where we can take our travels next. That's right, and we also um, said goodbye to two of our awesome coaches, Penelope Watson and Andy Good. Uh, they're moving on um, and uh, doing some different stuff. Penelope sort of getting into the swim business with, with Fit and Able more so, and their um, accommodation business. And Andy Good has got a role with Ara with um, with in a teaching role, which is pretty exciting for them. So they've been awesome and uh, made a massive difference to people that they've worked in our community as well. So you need to thank them, and it was really good to be able to acknowledge them in front of a group of others as well. Yeah, yeah. Now, just before we uh, get going on the show tonight, Richard, there's a few other things going on. There's a few activities going on in the background there, uh, some coming up races before we get to a specific activity. I just want to have a, a, a quick yell out to anybody who's got any interest in cyclocross. The cyclocross season is about to start here in Christchurch, Southern Cross Cyclocross Series. Uh, is about to, I can see Steve uh, in the background throwing his arms up. That's good. He's a good king cyclocross man. So we're about to kick off this Sunday at uh, Frauiti Domain. Head across to the Southern Cross Cyclocross page on Facebook if you want any more details. But if you're looking for a high intensity, uh, a lot of fun um, effort on your Sunday, cyclocross is the place to go. Angus, I'm scared. I'm not sure if I should come along. You're lycra clad and you look really fast. Am I going to be looked after or am I going to feel like a bit of an idiot? Well, I tell you, so small story really quickly, but um, we will take anybody. We will take any shape, sizes, uh, you name it, you come along. We will take you on a mountain bike, on a cyclocross bike. Uh, we've got tandem racing. Uh, we've got quite a collection of people that turn up and race tandems. So we've got a development grade. We've got B grade. We've got A grade. We can cater for all things. A little handy hint, though, if, Richard, when you come along on Sunday, if you've got a skin suit, uh, in your cupboard, do bring it because uh, <laughs> there's always a head start for those, a 20 metre head start for those wearing a skin suit. So I advise you to wear it. What about a onesie? I've got a few of those. It's got a frog yes. and a flingo and a leopard. We'll give you, we'll put you up the front in your onesie, pride good, in good. place, uh, no problems at all. Good, 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 good. Uh, and the other last thing we've got going on is our Everest Challenge for May as a bit of a community thing. Get out and about how many vertical metres can you do during the course of May as a, as a result of uh, Sue and Hillary climbing Mount Everest in May. So how are you getting on, Angus? Well, actually, I'm going quite well, Richard. Well, probably, you know, we're, we're uh, nearly halfway through the month. So uh, mm -hmm. I guess if you're looking for targets to go there, I was looking today in the show notes there, Richard, and you quite proudly put in the show notes that you've done, you had done 2,722 metres. Uh, I think you I th as of yesterday, that's right. And I think you were gloating a little bit there that you were sort of 100 metres ahead of me. So um, there's no point talking about yesterday. We really should just talk about today. And I think the new tally, Richard, is, is that you've now got 2,877 metres in the bank. <laughs> right, I've got another 150 in the bank. How good is that? I have that's to say, Kiwi's cool. not great for vertical metres. I went for a run the other day and got three for 35 minutes worth of work. Um, so... A bit, but it, you've got to say that fact. Like you should be eight thousand eight hundred forty-eight vertical meters. Should be about four thousand right now. So I am a little bit off the off the pace. But me on the other well. hand, Richard. Me on the other hand, who's now clocking four thousand and ten meters, uh, is, right? is probably just there or thereabouts on the pace. Right. Okay, well done, well done. Well, that's dubious. I'm not sure if I believe that, but we'll have a look and we'll send it to the arbitrators. Um, yeah. later on maybe we should it's, move on with their show angus it's all there on strava um <laughs> in fact there you go zwift a very good way to catch up when you don't want the team captain to beat you dial in von two on on zwift grab 1200 meters uh of climbing and uh put you back in the game you weren't available on our group ride tonight i can see that's what you're doing instead okay well correct done. hey <laughs> smart cookie yeah yeah Move on, Angus. Speaking of smart cookies, that's right. Let's move along. And speaking of smart cookies, our first guest tonight is uh, it definitely goes in that smart cookie basket, Richard. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Steve Rickaby is a sports scientist and currently works with Cycling New, Ze New Zealand's elite level athletes uh, and those on a development pathway to performing on the world stage. So I got to know Steve while I was at university back in the late 90s, actually, and uh, did, a, did a summer or two working at the library, moving moving books and all sorts. And he was he was doing his master's at that point um, 
in, in sports science and then also worked together at Canterbury University uh, around two, uh, 2002, I think I started there for a couple of years and uh, been in touch with him ever since. He's helped us out with a whole bunch of different testing and support for our athletes and uh, as he was working for Canterbury University and then has moved moved on to Cycling NZ. So Steve's just arrived back from a training camp in the Coromandel, so keen to discuss everything high performance sport and, all, and testing to the latest research and recovery techniques and what that camp was all about as well. How are you doing, Steve? Are you there, Steve? Oh, now, Steve may be having a little internet issue here, Richard. He was busy telling me before the show that uh, yeah, he's on the same uh, rural band as you are. So we'll just give him a minute here to see if he... Are you there, Steve? I think I think Steve's uh, a little bit delayed there. Um, Shall we... Um, have a check in maybe to see uh, darling uh, okay. there we go. i'll just do this just give, just me, give him a second give me a second he's just oh, I, I think what what he's trying to do is go off his uh, mobile wi-fi and try and hotspot his phone uh richard to the computer there so uh, I know how he feels. Was, he's under a bit of pressure right now. So maybe we, I don't really want to go back to talk about your Everesting mission. So maybe what we should talk about is Darren De Groot on how well he's doing currently um, in our Everesting uh, numbers. He's way out in front. I saw him on a mission up up the tall lease range actually the other day, uh, getting up there and had to turn around as a result of weather and things. But just a uh, man on a mission. He always uh, amps for me, enjoys seeing how many vertical meters he can get and generally does them all on foot as well which is pretty impressive mm. and and actually something else we could talk about while we're here the everesting right. thing because you know how much i love a bit of everesting on a bicycle and how, how avidly i follow it but uh a few only uh oh, a month or so ago they actually reset the everesting record to six hours 40 minutes and 54 seconds so um now Put that in perspective there a little bit. When I was climbing up Von 2 on um, on Swift this afternoon or this evening, I did my first 900 metres in the air, just not not going deep, just powering up there. So that's 900 metres in the air. You need to do 8,000. Uh, you know, going on that rate, you're talking about nine hours or something at that rate that I was going up there at is about where you're looking. Now, wind the clock back to six hours 40, the pace that they are going and doing these meters is just absolutely incredible yeah no, that is that is crazy 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 stuff i don't think i could drive a motorbike that fast never mind ride a bike. <laughs> yeah maybe there's an e-bike now steve i think you may have sorted out your internet so uh you uh, can you hear us now i can certainly hear you can you hear me we can perfect mate perfect. perfect first of all before we get too far away i just want to say steve thank you very much for joining us you were giving us a little uh background into what a day in the life of steve rickaby entails uh and today man you're a busy lad and here you are giving us up some time you've bounced from one thing to another and uh thank you very much for joining us not a problem absolute pleasure Brilliant. Um, so, Steve, give us a little bit of background and tell us how you got to work for Cycling NZ and what does your role entail? Um, okay, so let's – the role, my title is um, Upper South Performance Hub Coach. Um, so I am one of four other hub coaches around the country. So one in Auckland, two based in um, Cambridge, one for BMX, which is a national hub, one for Cambridge Track – and one in Invercargill, um, based around the velodrome there. So our kind of setup is a wee bit different. We're not associated with a indoor velodrome, and that's where Cycling NZ basically target for medals and their funding is around, hey, medals in that kind of arena. So I take a wee bit of a, a wider mandate. Uh, we're currently just about to um, accept our new intake for the next 21 to 22 kind of year. And so we've got a mixture of uh, BMX riders, mountain bike, road, and track and road athletes. So we're looking mm -hmm. to induct about 22 um, come the end of the month, which is pretty cool. So working back from there, yes, um, I think you alluded to a wee bit earlier. I'm a sports scientist by trade. Um, I've got a master's uh, from Otago, um, School of Physical Education down there. Um, I've always loved sport. I'm not a great athlete. You know, I'm just Joe Blow. C grade kind of CB rider, 
Um, I managed to play rugby in England for a season, did all the traditional kind of sports and bits and pieces, but just love sport and the challenge. And as I've kind of moved on with the physiology kind of thing, understanding how the body works, it's more about, hey, how do people work? How do we get the best out of the person to actually achieve their goals or their performance that they want to? Um, and so I've been coaching probably for about 20 years, um, firstly in the gym. Uh, that was mm-hmm. my background, um, and then more so around endurance kind of sport, probably in the last 10 to 15, um, mostly now with gravity-based cycling. And then, although I'm saying that, I've got a couple of young roadies um, at the moment, um, but the others are all enduro riders and downhill. Um, right. I don't teach the skill set. That's frightening. I'll leave that to them. Yeah. Um, but more program management, around gym stuff, time management, on bike conditioning, all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of it's the off bike kind of bits and pieces that yeah, they need some direction on more so. Yeah, nice, 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 nice. So if someone's trying to go faster or further than they have before, what are some key recommendations uh, that you would give to get started to help them actually achieve that further and faster? Yeah, so for, obviously the, they've got a probably an event in mind. So that's the first thing. Hey, target mm-hmm. something. Um, yep. And then I would say, hey, number one, get a coach. Number two, get a coach, get a good coach. So, yeah. hey, going to you guys is a good place to start, you know, Team CP. Um, find someone that understands your demands. So it's not just, hey, no one, there's very few professional athletes who can dedicate 20 to 30 to 35 hours of training. So um, find someone that works for you and understands mm-hmm. your demands and can manipulate a program that suits your lifestyle. Um, Because just going, hey, here's a program that George Bennett uses, shit, you'll go fast on the bike. Well, who's going to do that with people working 40 to 45 hours, whatever, family commitments, et cetera? It's not going to happen. Yeah. So that would be my recommendation. Um, Enjoy what you're doing. Um, Yeah. Be realistic in what you can achieve. um, But don't be scared to actually have that big, chunky kind of goal that you can kind of have a crack at. Yeah. yeah, nice. So maybe Something that scares you. So, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. So in terms of those, like there's those big rocks, isn't there, that we often talk about in, in terms of training load, sleep, recovery, nutrition, those sorts of things to, to help manipulate and manage. Um, in regards to that training load, like what are your thoughts on sort of how hard people should be training across the course of a, I guess, a week for a start and then then looking beyond that sort of in the big picture? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of hype around high intensity kind of training. And mm. hey, there's no doubt that it, it'll improve your fitness um, and it will improve your speed, et cetera. But is it sustainable? Um, mm. So that's the big question. So doing it, hurting yourself, you know, that hard, you know, doing a Tabata session and actually doing it properly, you shouldn't be you know, walking out of the shoot at the end and going, God, that was a good session. You know, you should be going, yeah. oh, jeepers, that's it, man, I'm yeah. cooked. Yeah. Um, sustaining that becomes really, really challenging. So I would say general rule of thumb, hey, if you can do two intensity sessions per week, one could be a race, um, a club race yeah. or something, if you're cycling or whatever, running, and the other one would be some sort of intensity session. It could be at your functional threshold power or speed or pace or whatever, um, or it could be some some sprint intervals. And the rest then would probably be around, hey, endurance pace, could be a recovery session, it could be something else. But in general, rule of thumb. Some weeks, hey, you need to probably do more than that, maybe yeah. three to four sessions um, around that intensity, but you need to then monitor the volume that you're doing in, in total. Um, yeah, brilliant. And, and a lot of that is also talked about, actually, you can't overtrain, but you can under-recover, which is where that sleep and the balance of stress and life comes into it as well as you've just been talking about yeah yeah so um if if you're using something like training peaks um, where they have that tss that training stress balance thing um based off the time you spent around your threshold um hey this is the tss of life hey managing your Mm -hmm. your family life your kids your work and things like that so you know the olympic athletes are looking to average around a thousand to you know a thousand tss points a week (laughs) um the olympic cyclists for track um, for the guys, so that's a big week. Um, that's the average they're aiming for. Mm-hmm. So, um, hey, you try doing a thousand TSS points, that's a pretty big week if you're working and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, balancing, balancing that. Make sure you have some recovery time. Um, as a sports scientist, as your background, um, part of your role is testing and to check in on progress. And obviously, you've got athletes that are at a certain level, and you need to make sure that they're developing and and uh, hitting their targets as part of your role as well. What are some tests that athletes are doing, and uh, how often are they testing, and can you over test? Certainly can over test. Um, yeah, that fatigue, knowing that you have to hurt yourself um, mm. is always a, a challenge. You know, it's not a race. It's you to see if you're improving. So that can be a bit of a, a mental uh, blockage. Um, yeah, we certainly test. And I would say, look, even if it's just one test a year, um, ideally probably twice a year, maybe a wee bit more frequently. And I'm talking about maybe if it's an endurance-based athlete, hey, a lactate threshold test to or something similar to that, or an FTP test yeah. on the bike, or a running test. Hey, where well, you're looking at um, that kind of threshold, functional threshold, power, speed. Hey, where is that sitting now versus six months ago, three months ago, etc. Um, right. Time-wise, to get adaptation, you're probably looking somewhere between six to eight weeks to see a measurable change. So testing yeah. every week is just wasting energy in some respects, mental probably energy. Um, yeah. But in saying that, it's still a good hard session if you wanted mm. to do it every week. If yeah. you had a vindictive or a psychotic coach, you wanted you to do a 40k <laughs> time trial on the bike um, every week. Hey, go for it. That's your test. Um, are you yeah. improving? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then that's the thing is, is cooking yourself because it, oh gosh, I've got to put myself through that again. So yeah, six to eight weeks is a is a to see some physiological changes and some adaptions and some actual improvement. And that's what you want to see. You want to see that. And hey, if you're not seeing that, well, why not? I guess is the questions you're asking. Is oh, it? definitely, definitely. So mm -hmm. is the training being completed as prescribed? Is the training correct? Um, mm -hmm. All those kind of questions come out. You're too much load, too much intensity, not enough, et cetera. Those are conversations you can have then with the coach and the athlete. Um, you can yeah get some pretty good responses out of that. Well, you should be able to yeah. um, delve into those kind of questions. So the whole bunch of stuff. So that's just you know that's basic endurance testing. If you're looking at strength and power, there's a whole lot of other things you can do as well in terms of gym based explosive ability. You know vertical jump, broad jump, those kind of things. We're doing, mm. trying to play around with the moment about neurological load. How do you look at that? How do you gauge some ready to perform? Um, you know, do they need an extra rest kind of thing? No one's cracked that in terms of a simple test. You know? It might be, hey, just subjective. Those old hand grip strength things, uh, like uh, right. some gyms have collars you put on and they're just like a grip strength, even something like that. Yep. Can I squeeze it really close? Easily. Yeah, um, fresh today gee that's really hard oh, i'm a bit fatigued i might change my session mm. yeah right that's interesting isn't it yeah so neuromuscular and how, how much effort and how keen am i am i fizzing or am i not so okay something as simple as that that's interesting yeah so you know the the key difference you know between elite athletes and sub elite is hey the hard sessions are incredibly hard they mm. hit every interval full gas or at the right intensity every time and they'll probably do extras because hey, that's the kind of person they are hey, you're supposed to mm. do 10 actually i did 12 because i still felt i had something to give um and the recovery sessions are really really easy generally yep. okay it's mm. hey guys on the bike you're doing 25 k's an hour and it's for 30 to 40 minutes and people are passing you you know suck it up princess <laughs> you know um yeah. that's what yeah, it's yeah, about yeah. about recovery yeah. So I guess that's the thing, is that knowing when to go hard and when I'm good and knowing when to cruise and take it easy. And, and a big part of that is about that routine and which part of your week is it and what I've done yesterday. Um, and the more of a routine you can get into, the better that you have the chances of uh, uh, understanding and listening to your body. Oh, for sure. Um, and, and I've seen it, and you've probably seen it as well and experienced it yourself. Hey, if you're doing kind of threshold efforts towards the end of the week, Sometimes you just can't get, you know, produce the power, your heart rate won't get up. And that's probably related mm. to fatigue. You know, what you've done earlier mm. in the week when just life's got on the way and suddenly it's really, really hard. So actually, hold on, let's reschedule those for maybe Tuesday. Hey, Monday's a rest day. Tuesday, I'm fresh. Hey, quality session on Tuesday. Get the work done. Hey, over the weekend, I'm doing long rides. Yeah, it's generally fatiguing, but it, it's not, 
you know, that damaging in some respects. Um, I can then focus on some real quality sessions early in the week. Um, and particularly in summer, things like dehydration. You know, if you're later in the week trying to do those kind of sessions, you may find you're a wee bit dehydrated, so heart rate won't come up, um, those kind of mm-hmm. things. Yeah, nice. Um, you're at the cutting edge. Your research of and and obviously that's part of your role as well is is to develop athletes and people. Um, what is new? What is there new that you can tell us? Obviously, because you don't want the Aussies to find out about this. Um, is there anything you can share to to the NCP community that will help? I guess us and uh, look, to improve our performance. Yeah, look, there's so much. Oh, you can't keep up with it. It's it's impossible. Um, there's just so much going on. Uh, it, it's trying to, you know, there's no, there's probably no research in respect to everybody stealing ideas. So, hey, if you can steal some ideas and if it kind of makes sense to you, you might better try it and you know, it kind of works. Um, mm. You know, you're constantly kind of testing ideas out. So things like, well, we played around a lot with during um, our group in lockdown with, we couldn't go to the gym, so we did online and we a lot of isometric kind of stuff and that was really interesting okay. just anecdotal hey we build up to isometric holds for uh, you know two minutes three minutes you know and i found out some of our top athletes are going even higher up to five minutes critical um but actually recruitment you get it's it's simulating um, what they call blood occlusion, um, so actually cutting off the blood flow to, or restricting the blood flow to certain uh, limbs okay. for a period of set period of time. For God's sake, don't go away and go, yeah, I'm going to stop my blood flow to my my neck or something for, for five minutes. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> please please but, don't do that. Um, so just so what on you're trying that, to do so is get it. Thinking- Yep. Sorry, Steve. You were, you were talking isometric holds. So that's a no movement is what yes. isometric means. And so, for example, a yep. prone hold or a wall sit, those sorts of things. Yep. Yep. We did um, for cycling and running lunges, really long yep. athletic lunge, really deep. You're trying to drop that back knee close to the ground and just hold it off and the ground and, and hold it. No arms on anything. Your arms are just at your side and you're trying to grin and bear it. And so start with like 30 seconds or even 20 seconds and progress for there. Um, right. It does uncomfortable, but what we found is that hey, in the afternoon, a ride you can do anything you like. You can smash it. Your legs are fine. You're not getting the the, the delayed muscle storms or damage you would expect. For you know, it's incredibly painful at the time, really uncomfortable. Yep. But then hey, a couple of hours later, not a problem. You do it. Yeah. Like. And 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 so longer what, term, strength wise and strength gains, they were seen to uh, really benefit from that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, in particular, if you haven't got access to a gym and stuff like that, or weights and bits and pieces, yep. here's a way you can overload those just to recruit those muscles um, and call on them more so than, in, hey, to get that same sort of impact from a gym, you have to be doing hundreds of reps and bits and pieces um, or very, very heavy legs, et cetera. And so, so there's some... Um, there's a lot of research looking at occlusion training at the moment. So isometric holding is, is one form of that. Um, and some potential performance benefits. It's a really muddy kind of area, but some of the athletes are, are delving into it in terms of uh, looking at that. Again, yeah, cool. you've got to use that in context. Where you are, you're planning. Where are you in terms of your event? Um, how can you use it in bits and pieces like that? The other one I'd quickly mention is things like passive heat um, as a real um, benefit post training so done your yeah. exercise within five to 15 minutes if you can get into a sauna um again there's some health implications around that you need to you know just be aware of that but there's some real benefits in terms of doing that um in terms of endurance adaptations uh, muscular um plasma volume so the watery part of your blood expanding which is all benefits for endurance exercise um yeah. Right. So getting your body to adapt to the heat effectively. So a sauna is one option. Can we do that uh, mm. having a extended hot shower or a, or a bath or a, or actually just wearing too many clothes? Or what? what's the story? Um, you possibly the can. Um, yeah, it, it, it's probably not as good because you won't get as possibly as warm. And it, um, But it, okay. it's worth probably playing around with. I haven't looked at the research in that depth and those kind of avenues 
Um, certainly the yep. major stuff is around that kind of smaller kind of work passive. Uh, the other one is, hey, if you've got a small room, you can put a trainer in it or something or a skipping rug. Hey, if you can heat it, you know, put a heater in there, a jug for some humidity and stuff like that. Um, maybe chuck on some extra clothing. Um, where you go, you'll, um, you'll generate some some pretty good heat there. But you, again, yeah. just be careful um, with your sweating and stuff like that and how you're feeling and you can get quite lightheaded <laughs> quite quickly. Yep. Yeah. And Make that's sure also you've got to be a bit careful about yeah, ready. Um, but some of the research is around limiting your, your fluid intake as well um, okay. post um, and just being careful with it and not, yeah, but certainly not restricting it, um, yeah, not um, getting rid of it, but having it in restricted amounts for a certain period of time afterwards and then gradually building it back up, yeah. Because obviously all of this stuff is about uh, you're stressing your body and your body has to adapt to that. So if you're, if you're working in a dehydrated yeah. state, Sometimes then your body has to adapt to to that and working around that, doesn't it? So uh, how you around plasma volume and things like that, your body uh, may adapt to improve that. So then you can actually mm. increase that, which will help your your cardiac output and help you actually go faster at the end of the day. Yeah, and there's all anecdotal stories of the old professional cyclists, you know, doing training on one bottle in the Spanish heat for for seven hour rides and stuff like that. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, you've got to have it in the right context, and you need people behind you, kind of guiding your um, your strategy around that. Why you're doing it? What are the implications and things like that? And it might not be for for a very defined period of time. Hey, I've got yeah. an event. It is in the heat hey, this is where we can possibly get some adaptation relatively easily in a controlled manner, but it needs to be in that controlled manner, not just, yeah, I'm not going to drink for 48 hours and get yourself into a world of trouble. Uh, just on that, uh, one last question around that passive heat. Does it need to be daily or can it be twice a week or what's how often do you need to do it to make a physiological good, adaption? Do you know? Yeah, really good question. Generally, I would say, look, start off cautiously in terms of the duration and the frequency but every yeah. other day um and then build up from there so i would then look at doing ultimately you're doing every day in a row for seven to ten days before All you right. then come out um but generally hey you, yeah yeah um you probably want to start with maybe only three sessions a week and just see how you adapt and maybe start mm -hmm. off at just 20 even 10 minute sessions and go you might mm -hmm. if you're coming from a cross stitch winter Yep. Jumping into a, a sauna, whew, geez, and you know, you might really struggle. Everyone else adapts differently and how you react. So, hey, body size wise as well, smaller, lighter people tend to adapt a wee bit better to the heat give, um, yep. versus heavier people with more muscle mass or fat distribution. Hey, they can all have an impact. Yeah, nice. Um, Steve, you've just returned from a training camp that you were a part of up in the Coromandel with Cycling NZ. Um, what was that about? What did you do? What were some of the key outcomes you were shooting for? What, how did you actually do that? Um, and, and uh, yeah, what was some of the crazy stuff that you were a part of? <laughs> so it was um, for a group that it's the men's endurance development squad. So these yeah. are riders that are kind of on the pathway. They've been identified. They've, we had, I think, two from our hub um, yeah. who are kind of on this pathway now being long tracked for potentially Paris in 2024 Olympics and possibly even Com Games. Mm -hmm. So it was an opportunity to, to do some work on the road to, mm -hmm. for the, the elite men's endurance coach to come across and, and see them in action for a couple of days and also talk yeah. to them about the transition. Okay, what are the elite squad doing? This is where this is the kind of work we tend to do with them um, and just observing them and putting them under a wee bit of load and seeing how they kind of respond to that um, there was a, a definite uh, leader in the group who had been he's done a couple of the elite camps so he was kind of mm -hmm. identified as being hey he's the leader on the road and he will kind of then um, you know put the hurt down at certain periods of time um, via the coach's instructions and yeah and everyone just hang on and see if you can challenge each other generally it was on the climbs and stuff so the day one was 160k ride um, it yeah. took in part of the K2 um, around the Coromandel, and then the next day was similar, but I had a 30K piece of gravel just on their road bikes. Yeah. Um, that was yeah. a 6K. Well, was that, no, it was about 25Ks, I think, 20 to 25Ks. I had a 6 yeah. or 7K climb and about a 9K descent, um, which is kind of fun watching them coming down the hill. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> sketchy at times, uh, yeah. but they weren't hanging around. It was hard work in the car trying to keep up with them. 
Yeah. Um, and the final, uh, no, the next day was an early morning wake up call at seven. They they were in bunk rooms. They all got woken up at seven. It doesn't sound that early for most people, but for these yeah. guys, it was yeah, it was probably an early wake up. They had five minutes to get to the beach, and they did a body weight circuit on the beach. And then they had to do um, a couple of swimming activities, um, mm -hmm. trying to keep a cone out of the water and passing around the team, and then dragging themselves out of the out of the water up to the finish line without using their legs. So kind of paralyzed from the waist down and just using your arms and legs and stuff to drag yourself up. So it was a few interesting moments, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, then we, we had some North Island versus South Island team time trials. Um, South yep. won both. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah good job. Over a 10K course, they were back to back. So they kind of previewed the course to the lap and then set off a minute and a half apart and smashed it out. Um, and then the final sounds day. Like a, sounds like a Sunday group ride, actually. Exactly that, given heaps. Yeah, it was it was pretty impressive. I think they mm. were averaging about 48, 49 Ks an hour and it wasn't flat. <laughs> um, yeah, and this yeah, is right. just on their standard, standard road bikes. And then the yeah. final day was back the way we kind of came a wee bit um, similar. It's about 100, it was supposed to be 160 Ks, but the riders were quite keen. They were up already and did an hour early, um, mm. which is cool. And and then they need to do a bakery stuff on the way back. Um, so it was about a 200 K ride. So about 560, yeah, 580 Ks in four days. So some some good, good work done, um, a bit of challenge put down. They got an understanding of what, hey, the elite program are doing. Um, they, the elite, Olympic men's team had just done a, a whole week camp before mm -hmm. and one of their riders before that, this is you know, giving an example of the, the kind of thinking around it before going into that camp, he did a 200k ride just to put himself under the, the pump a wee bit and then did the whole seven days and, and then did another 200k ride to finish. Um, yeah, right. So and is he performing at the level we should be or are you, or are you aware that he's already done 200k's? Oh uh, no, he he was um, that was he performed during the camp. He just wanted to put himself under a bit of pressure, you know, in terms of you know. And that group apparently is really really tight. They g each other up and just you know want to get the best out of each other. Um, mm. And that was the one thing that really came through. Okay, it's it's cool to do it on your own, but it's bloody hard to do it on yourself. You know, every day that grind. Um, so hey, why don't you use your teammates and g each other along and, and become really a cohesive team because you need to yep. trust that person in front of you when you're on the track in a team's pursuit doing 65 k's an hour and you're one mil two mils off the back of their wheel and you can't see where you're going um yep, yep, you need to have yep. that trust um so so just looking at that elite athlete perspective is that that one thing that you've alluded to is just how deep they go and how hard they put that effort in and how much they train i guess it's the volume and intensity is uh, of what they're actually bringing to the table yeah, which is quite surprising. Um, yeah, probably five, six years ago, road, the road volumes were probably dropping off, but now that's mm. it's the road volumes are, are pretty high. But there's there's a bunch of intensity in there as well. They do some pretty mm. brutal kind of stuff. Mm. Um, they did a um, a camp prior to Christmas where they did gravel camp and took their gravel back, uh, bikes around Queenstown and did some some pretty big adventures. I've seen a couple of videos of them going through these four-wheel drive tracks into mud holes and the riders kind of going, how do we ride around this? And a couple of them going in and disappearing into the mud and <laughs> just completely flipping off their bikes and going for a swim, basically. So it's all, hey, cool adventures, hard work, um, rather than just sitting in the velodrome and turning left all the time. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It gets awesome. pretty mundane. Yeah. <clears throat> Gravel adventure sounds exactly right up my alley, Steve. But um, hey, listen, just when you were just talking before about uh, heat adaptation or whatever you call it, and and bits and pieces, I got a question: <clears throat> training the body, how, or a how trainable is the body for? I guess going back to that fluid consumption and bits and pieces, uh, as a lot of us compete in some endurance events uh, and often. You know, you, you're only carrying, you can only carry a certain amount of bottles. There may be an aid station, but you don't want to lose time by stopping to fill it. Can I train my body to use less fluid than what it currently does? I'm quite a heavy fluid consumer, I suppose, and, and need that. Is there a, can I train myself to use less or not? Uh, that's an interesting question. It may depend on the environment you're in, particularly if you're in a hot, humid environment. 
you need to be consuming, you know, you need to maintain that water balance basically within your body. Um, if you don't, hey, things are starting to shut down and that could potentially, A, be detrimental to your performance, but also potentially be life-threatening. So you need to be careful of that. Um, can you train yourself to use? Yeah, look, you, your sweating certainly becomes more efficient. So, hey, you'll tend to sweat earlier. Um, your sweat will be less dilute, so you're going to lose less electrolytes. So potentially you may not have to put as much in. Um, but if you are training in that environment, I would be saying you should not be restricting fluids. And in fact, I'd be saying potentially at the aid station, slow down, walk, have the fluids, get them in, because that is going to allow you to run faster later rather than going, crap, I'm in the... I'm in some difficulty here because I missed that fluid station. I ran past it when I should have actually walked and slowed down. Um, what you will tend to, yeah, as I said, hey, you're going to get more efficient in terms of your fluid use, your ability to sweat and stuff like that as you become fitter um, and as you become, yeah, you, do you really need less? So, uh, so, it's so it's a that, real grey area. Is that the thing then? Is it, is it just a fitness strength um, conditioning thing like when I get on the start line of a 200k bike race or something and and man next to me's only got two bottles and I'm trying to carry three and work out how I'm going to get another one and they ride another 4k an hour average faster than I do but still only use the same two bottles mm -hmm. is that just straight uh, conditioning and fitness that's getting them there? No, no there's probably some genetics in that as well hey we're all genetically slightly different um, and how we we produce power and hey, process food and bits and pieces like that. We, we are slightly different. So can you train yourself off it? Oh, I don't know. And is it something you want to try? <laughs> um, um, you do the so research. Yeah, that's a really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a really it. interesting question. I, I wouldn't want yeah, to I, say limit your fluids to improve your performance, and particularly if it's a hot environment. Yeah, there's there's, yeah, certainly so, some, there's more to lose than to gain. Mm. Yeah, like you were saying, Steve, basically, hey, that sometimes you can manipulate that from a training perspective, but from a performance perspective, get into your fluid because that's gonna yeah. um it's gonna, it's gonna yeah. help. That's basically to summarize that, isn't it? So yeah, so what are you trying to do is trying to get an adaptation. Then you want to use that adaptation to its maximum ability in your race. So don't yeah. restrict yeah. fluids in a race get it into yeah. you. And so that was the one thing that um, the coaches were talking about in this training camp. You guys have got to eat. You've got to eat on the bike. You've got to eat off the bike because what you're doing today, tomorrow or for the next day. So you might be good today, mm -hmm. but you didn't eat a lot. The next day you're a bit off. The next day you're in a real hole. And why is that? Well, because three yeah, days yeah. ago you didn't eat enough. So mm -hmm. look, you're trying to do a really specific adaptation, but come race day, you want to maximize that adaptation. You want to fuel do everything properly yeah 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 nice uh, training is training is wrap up. Here's, here's steve just to finish off uh angus uh, do you want to take a lead on this one yeah totally so steve we're bringing back the quick five questions uh we thought you're the perfect guest to to whip them out on again so just i'll lead away you just answer whatever you think comes quickest uh one of my favorite questions training morning or afternoon endurance doesn't matter Strength, I'd say early afternoon in the gym. What about use though, Steve? When are you training? I ride at sometimes at five o'clock in the morning to get to work. <laughs> um, other times it'll be whenever I can fit it in around the family. So sometimes in right. generally not in the evening, not after six o'clock. Right, I can't okay. sleep. So we've got a dollar break kind of thing there. I think I think Angus will <laughs> do that. <laughs> uh, best NZ sports facility, Steve. Uh, the one I've probably seen is Cambridge. The the velodrome there is pretty cool. Yeah, it's a pretty right, cool nice. facility. Yeah. Slightly uh, biased. <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy a fancy meal out at a restaurant or are you uh, around the home cook, home table uh, with a good old home-cooked meal kind of guy? Jesus. Um, do like a good home cook. Um, we tend not to, to venture out too much, um, so I'd probably say home. Home cook for the family. Yeah, nice, nice. Favorite ride, Steve? What's your favorite ride to do? Ooh. I have liked um, the old Evans Pass opening up. That's pretty cool. That's pretty yeah, epic yeah. now. You missed that for how many years was it shut? Like, since forever, like 10, 10 years or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, that the climb, 
out of uh, from Little River up to um, on the other side of Lake Forsyth up to the Bossu the Road. Bossu yeah. Road. Yeah, that's Love pretty it. epic. Yeah, yep. that's something a wee bit different. Um, yep. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, you're talking about out of uh, Birdlings Flat or out of Little River. No, out of Little River. So you come into Little River. Okay. Before you get to the township, hang a hard right, go across the other side of Lake Forsyth. Um, yeah. And you go so either up the Kinlock, Kinlock, Kinlock Roads, the Tar Seal one, or you go yep. up your Kuru Valley there and you go up no, Reynolds Kinlock. Valley. But you're talking about yes. Kinlock. Yeah, Kinlock, because <laughs> it turns to shingle at the top and then you go that's down it. into the, in the in the bays. I can't remember the bays over there, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. that's an epic ride. Nice. Nice. Um, finally, mountain bike, road bike, or I saw you celebrating in the background before, or a CX bike. What is your favourite uh, two wheels? Uh, I'd have to say my road bike uh, at the moment, uh, a Canyon. It's yeah, I love it. It's probably the best bike I've had. Um, I'm dead keen on getting a, a gravel bike. That'll be my next investment. I might trade in my commuter bike. I'm going to do. I'm quite keen to come out and do my first cyclocross race at the weekend on my Perfect. commuter bike which is just a, an old Avanti Corsa with 23 mil tires so that's going to be exciting <laughs> brilliant I'll give you a onesie to wear if you like Stephen you can start it I've front. got a onesie mate I've got a onesie <laughs> and job. Well done. how heavy does it weigh because I can guarantee you that at Rowiti Domain there will be a couple of lovely little sandy sections where you'll be off and running and carrying that thing Oh, if I strip off uh, the bits and pieces on it, like all my lights and stuff, it might weigh in at a healthy nine kilos or something. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Steve, thank you so much for giving up uh, your time tonight. Thank you for joining us and sharing us a little bit of an insight into what it's like to be a sports science scientist, to be working with Cycling NZ and all the things going on there. Um, again, all the best for everything that you have going on for all our New Zealand athletes that you're involved with. Thank you very much for helping get them to the top of their game and the top of the tree. And we'll see you Sunday. Sounds good. Yeah, hopefully I can make it. Absolute pleasure, guys. Thank you for good having job. me. Well done, Steve. Good to catch up. Thanks, heaps. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Cheers, Richard. Cheers. Just like that. How good. You've got another uh, um, person lined up on the start line on I, Sunday. And the, the recruitment office is open, Richard. <laughs> Good. <laughs> is Beth still there or is she gone? She might have <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> do you think she do you think do you think Beth will ride across by? Um, <laughs> now just before we do get to, just before we do get to Beth, just want to quickly say uh, again huge thanks to Giant Bikes NZ for sponsoring tonight's show. Um we have got some giant products to give away. We don't have a bike, unfortunately, Richard. That would have been that would have been pretty epic. But we've got yeah. something just as good to give away, some little spot prizes. So don't forget, drop us a comment. Tell us something you've learned or a takeaway that, that, that you've taken away from tonight's show. I'm going to give you a little a little bit of a head start there. Just listening to Steve and talking, listening to him talk about his um the old hand grip. Yeah, uh, there yeah. was a was, and using that almost as a little key indicator something so simple like that to use it as a key indicator just to keep a track of you know your freshness along the way yeah how keen am i how fizzed up am i and it makes sense doesn't it it's like oh, i can't be bothered or oh, yeah like I'm, I'm really into it let's lift some weights today or let's go hard on the bike mm. so, mm. so that's a little something that i would never have thought of as a way of trying to find some key indicators along the way mm. and things so uh big tip there from steve yep all right so Brilliant. we carry the show on move on Beth oh, is Beth is waiting patiently in the background there. She's almost got her chin on the bottom of her desk there while she's been resting, ready for this ready for this bit. So welcome, Beth. Welcome to the show. You will have to take that down. Zoom etiquette. You can take that off. <laughs> can. Oh, stuck on mute. Um, yes, thank you. Good to be here. Yep. Some, some good good work etiquette there, there Beth, um, from, uh, from Zoom, but you can relax now. Thank you. Off the clock. <laughs> this is this is more of that open mic night type style, Beth. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Hey, Beth, um, we want to get you on the show because uh, uh, you won our True Grit Award that we gave out on Friday night, which is really cool to be able to give you that and acknowledge all the the hard work that you did, um, the the um, the time and effort and energy you put into the longest day and the lead up, and obviously you had an awesome day out and and uh, did really well. Um, so, so yeah, really 
stoked to have you on the show and thanks for joining us. Um, just before we get into that, I just want to sort of tell you the quick story or share with listeners that weren't there on uh, Friday about what that True Grit Award is. So there's a young fellow, Zach Barker, that we that we worked with. It must have been the late 2000s, maybe 2008 or so. He had cystic fibrosis and he he um, he and his dad decided that they'll do the harbour ride. So this was back before the earthquake where there was a ride that went from Sumner round through town up and over Gibby's Pass, round the bay through Littleton, up and over the Evans Pass and back into Sumner again. And, and that's something he really, really wanted to do. Uh, on the day of the event, he wasn't in great shape. The doctor said they shouldn't, he shouldn't actually go, but he went anyway to do this event. He was in a team. He was doing the first leg of it on the flat. He was way last, so pretty much just about packing up the uh, the uh, transition area. Um, when he arrived, his dad uh, tagged him, carried on, uh, and did that his part of the ride. And he actually... As a team, they actually ended up getting third, which was pretty amazing. It's just something he really hung his hat on, and and that was about that. Le never giving up. Let's just uh, give it heaps, do our best as we possibly can, and and go deep to see how good we can go. And and that's kind of what that award is about. So, um, which basically kind of I think summed up your longest day as well, Beth. Like, how deep can we go, and how hard can we push to to make sure that we get across the finish line? Yes, although that sounds like a much um, harder feet than mine. <laughs> I mean, I had some setbacks, but nothing, nothing quite as extreme as that. So, uh, yeah. so, so, um, Beth, tell us about your goal. How long have you been working on? Or how long had you been working on or thinking about? That's something I'd like to do. That coast to coast longest day. Um, well, I did coast. I did the two day in two thousand sixteen. And then yep. I kind of thought, oh, I should do it again in 2017. And then I didn't. And then I kind of didn't get back to it until um, I was watching the 2021. And I thought, oh, it would be quite good to have another goal again. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I thought, oh, I'll enter it. And I just decided I knew I could do the two day. So I would <laughs> just give it a go and enter yeah. the longest day. Um, like, I really didn't know if I'd be able to do it or not. So that was pretty good motivation to do the training. So, um, yeah, so pretty much. And then I, I called you up, I think, Richard, and was like, oh, uh, so I've entered the longest day. Um, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, and, um, yeah, sort of started doing a bit of casual training pretty much straight away in March, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Brilliant. And it was like, okay, well, how are we actually going to do this thing? What, what are we going to do here? So what was the best bit and what was the toughest part of your training in the lead up across that? Oh, it was almost 12 months worth, I guess, in the end, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm not a fast runner. I guess it's all relative. Depends who mm. you're comparing yourself to. But running mm. was always going to be the challenge. Like we talked about that quite a lot. Um, yep. Yeah. So, so being able to get to a point where I was fit and fast enough to get over the run well enough um mm. without getting any injuries which i ended up ended up with one of those which disrupted things quite a lot so mentally probably yeah. the toughest thing was um not knowing if you could actually do the do the whole event i was pretty yeah. sure i could do it but with the cutoffs that makes it and that's the challenging thing yeah um mm. and yeah having the knowledge that you're not really being able to train as effectively as you'd like to which i know everyone has setbacks along the way so that was probably yeah. the toughest thing Yep, that injury. Yep. And the best part of your training? Um feeling fit. I yep. like the feeling of feeling fit, you know, like you can go and go for a long ride or a long run if you want to. Um yep. and then also like managing to get like going along to group sessions and stuff really gives you the opportunity to get to know people that you can go and train with. And it, you know, mm -hmm. with Coast it can take a wee while to build up a bit of a group of people that you trust to go kayaking mm. with and they trust you yeah. and um, so that was good. Managed to get yep. yeah, get to know a few people to train with, and that makes it. Uh, I think Steve was talking about makes it a lot easier to train and do hard training when you're with other people. So um, yeah, good. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And what about race day? What was the best bit and what was the toughest part? Let's go through that as well. <laughs> um, well, I'll start with the toughest bit because that was the start. Yep. So I knew I. Oh gosh, I had to come to terms with the fact that I knew I was going to be right at the back at the start because I. Yep had this ongoing leg thing which is like extremely painful when I was just doing sort of running like that first runners um yeah. better on rough stuff but just plain old running was like in intense pain so right. um I knew that that was coming at the start and it's not exactly a good feeling going into it's a not a way to start the day is that you can like I'll finish <laughs> that there but but not to start with that's tough yeah so 
that was that was hard because sort of came to terms with the fact that it was going to be terrible to start with and um, mm. and was it yep <laughs> it was yep, pretty, okay. it was pretty awful but um yeah yeah i mean i got to the bike got on the bike bike was a bit slower than i thought it was going to be but um yeah and then the good bit was coming to the end of the run and knowing that i was going to make it basically because that was what i was if i was going to make the run the run then um i thought i'd be fine you know unless mm. anything major went wrong yeah 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 brilliant so so hey you're you're good on the bike and you can paddle the river all that sort of stuff but it's actually just getting through that run in good shape and actually uh putting it all together and keeping on moving and digging deep across that mountain run uh especially after that tough start to the day and and uh going yeah cool i've got this and 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 although it's still hard and it's a long way to go and you're not even halfway yet actually that's a a pretty positive uplifting let's give it heaps now yeah yeah and it was such good conditions this mm. year like the conditions were perfect for me yep. really um so that really helped and yeah like a few things went wrong like the first ride was i would have liked to finish that earlier but you just kind of like the only thing you can do is go oh well that's what it is and carry on <laughs> <laughs> good stuff now that's awesome and that's that true grit uh thing is actually just going going deep and actually staying positive and seeing what what you might be up to and what could happen so i have to ask this is and you may have an answer or may not but but what's the next goal beth after a massive uh outing like that and a and a, and a big goal that you i guess you've probably been thinking about for a good four or five years yeah i mean on and off, yeah on and off but then mm. um the next goal, I think, I was just talking, yeah, I mentioned this the other night, I think, Richard, I I was <laughs> planning to do the longest day again, and I would yeah. still really like to, but I don't think it's going to happen yeah. next year, um, just because it's it's such a commitment, you know, like you're yeah. saying no to a lot of other things, and mm. I don't know, I find it quite hard to not get caught up in the, I have to do my training, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's good to have a break from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I was thinking I... I, I was lucky enough to get an entry, so I think I'll do the two day, um, and hopefully enjoy it a bit more. And um, not that I didn't enjoy all of it, but you know, just hopefully. It's just different, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 Awesome. Um, I think the two day is a great, great place to go, Beth. Um, you know, you've had the had the experience of what one day is like. You can go back to two day now and hone a few of the skills that you need and concentrate on a few areas. And then when you go back again to the one day again, you'll actually be in a in a way better position, I think, going yeah, forward for that. Cool to be involved, so, yeah. yeah, good stuff. Um, and probably what Angus really wants to know is, are you going to see him on Sunday for cyclocross? <laughs> I was actually, you know, I used to own a cross bike, Angus, and um, I got rid of it to to buy a road bike. <laughs> it was like oh, years ago. Right. I mean, another set of wheels would have done. You could add two sets of wheels on the <laughs> same bike anyway. Have you got a mountain bike, Beth? Yes. That'll do us. That will take you on your mountain bike. That's no problem at all. Richard's going to be there with his mountain bike and his kids are going to be there on their bikes and come join us. Awesome. I'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. As long as there's a sausage chisel, uh, sign me up. Well, actually, oh, no, there might be some hot fries here, actually, there, Richard. We could do some hot fries for you. Good stuff. Awesome, Beth. Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, fantastic uh, to be able to celebrate your success and well done on uh, on that. And hopefully you're still basking in your glory before you get too fired up for the next goal. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's always good to talk about it again. Look back at some photos. I remember, oh, yeah, that happened. It was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good job. Good job. Well done. Awesome. Okay. Take care. We'll catch up soon. Thank you. See ya. Thanks, Beth. Beth. See ya. Rich, I like Beth's attitude there. It's sort of... Uh, a bit of the old, uh, it is what it is, so let's just get on with it, right? And, yeah, that's right. Uh, actually, a really great attitude to take in all aspects of things. Uh, yeah, that's right. You, what can you control? You can only control the controllables, and, and you can't get caught up or, or disappointed or frustrated about something. So let's just uh, look forward and, and do as best as I can, especially tough when the first bit of your event is, uh, is going to be almost the toughest part um, to get around that or through that. And I'm not sure if we're even going to be able to do the next bit. So, yeah, pretty cool. She's done well. And we've often talked about that mental fortitude and using those top two inches and things. And and that's one of those things. Once you've got that, uh, it is what it is, so let's just get on with it. You actually find that sometimes you end up in a better position and end up having a better race or event or whatever uh, just because you've set that mindset already and it actually relieves a lot of the stress and pressure and away you go. And hello, by the time you get to the end of it, you've had a great day out. Yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Good job. Well, 
It's our final segment of the show again. It's uh, time to take the lunchbox lid off once more time. We, we welcome back Kushler back to our show last week. It was great to have her. So bringing her back for two in a row. Kushler, I've got one question straight out of the box. What do you know about cyclocross? <laughs> I've only seen it on your Instagram. Enough to entice you, yeah? Uh, possibly. It looks pretty savage. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough about that. Tell us, the tell answer, us some more about protein. <laughs> the answer is no, Angus. Oh. She's not going to turn up on Sunday. But we'll ask. Oh well, I'm, I'm about I'm about three out of four here so far. I'm going quite well, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, amazing. All over. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, uh, Kushler. Um, wanted to have a chat tonight about that. Like last week, we talked about protein and breakfast. Really, wasn't it? Was their main sort of topic we were we were going with. Um, thinking about the trend of people under eating protein in that first half of the day and what it ends up resulting in. Mm. So just carrying on from last week, um, often, very commonly, when people are under eating their protein in the first half of the day, it overflows into the second half of the day and it's often seen as uh, cravings mid-afternoon. You know, people talk about 3 p.m. sugar cravings or they come home from work and they just feel like they want to eat everything in the pantry or after dinner they have those major cravings. <laughs> what are you doing with the screen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't actually know. My mouse has got stuck and it's... Uh, look at that. Go to the air and... Oh, I got um, or after dinner, they have those cravings again and they just feel like they can't quite satisfy what they're after. And sometimes it's not always sugar cravings. It's just like a, just they can't satisfy their hunger and that often comes back to just under eating their protein. So it's really important to firstly get enough protein, but also that that protein spread more evenly through the day because too often it's saved for that final meal at night. Brilliant. Um, so you talked about a couple of breakfast options. For those people just uh, listening to this show, what, what were a couple of key breakfast protein options? Because it's actually what can I do? That's what people want to know about. Yes, it's all well and good, and I know I have to, have to eat protein, but what can I actually put in my bowl in the morning? On my plate. Yeah. So being really mindful of the cereal you're using and looking for sugar content, ideally anything with less than 10 grams of sugar per 100 or less mm -hmm. is better. Yeah. Um, high fiber, more than 5 grams per 100. But of course, what you pair with that cereal is just as important. So having a really high protein, unsweetened natural yogurt is a really good source of protein. Mm -hmm. um, good old eggs poached on some toast is a great breakfast to have. And yeah. you can make an omelette with a few eggs and add extra egg whites and some veggies or a little bit mm -hmm. of cheese in there um so yeah there are a few options you can also of course make your own type of things like you can make a oats type bar that you could grab and go that you might have you know mixed in with say banana and protein powder and that sort of thing and made like little muesli bars mm -hmm. um make homemade muffins for breakfast that are healthier yeah so it really depends on the person and what their morning looks like and what their food preferences are Yep, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Good stuff. And any other other, I guess, things that you'd recommend throughout that day? Obviously, breakfast is a key meal and you talk about that a lot, but other sort of key things to build upon. So um uh in terms of ideas and options. When it comes to lunch, I think lunch is a meal a lot of people struggle with. And mm. it can be a bit of a bore. Like I hate the thought of having to make a lunch as well. It's like an extra yep extra job you have to do at night the yep. easiest thing to do and i love doing it myself is you just make extra of dinner like enough for example if you're making dinner for two people make it to serve yep. three or four and mm -hmm. as you're serving up dinner put a serving of that aside and instantly put that away for lunch the next day mm -hmm. and that's like you cook once and eat twice and it's the easiest thing to do in the world so leftovers is a go-to but of course practically speaking if you're someone who works out in a field or away from like a kitchen or anything and you can't reheat your lunch or it's not appropriate to take then yep. you know something like a, a good sandwich or a wrap that will sort of keep through the day a bit more um yep. but filling that with enough protein is really important because like a couple of slices of ham is not much protein <laughs> pretty thin aren't they the old ham slices yep pretty pretty average like a couple of yep. thin slices of ham is virtually no protein at all so yep. yeah um you know, canned fish is a really practical option to take because it doesn't go off, obviously. You don't have to worry about yep. keeping it cold um, if you like that. Otherwise, things like boiled eggs are really good in your sandwiches. Mm -hmm. um, you could use leftover cold meats, lentils and legumes, chickpeas, mm -hmm. etc. Um, yep. 
something I was going to touch on with those foods that are plant-based protein sources is thinking about how efficient they are to eat for the actual protein amount you get. Okay. Uh, um, for example, you could eat 30 grams of chicken breast for, oh, sorry, 100 grams of chicken breast for 30 grams of protein, but you'd have to eat nearly half a kilo of chickpeas to get the same amount. Right. Yeah. Good. So it's so it is it, and is it also? I think you talk about being more available that protein, the animal proteins, opposed to the the chickpeas and lentils and things. Yes. So animal proteins are very bioavailable for our body to absorb mm -hmm. and use, which is really important. Um, whether plant based proteins aren't as bioavailable, and they're also incomplete in amino acids, which are those little building blocks to to our whole body that we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so if you are relying on more plant-based sources, it's really important that you sort of mix and match your protein sources in every meal to get a better variety of those amino acids. Mm. Yeah. yeah, good. So if someone wants to come and see you, wants a bit of help and support with their their nutrition, uh, basically just flick us a message, comment on this even, um, it would be a good way to do it. Uh, and, and you will help people actually say, right, eat this and this, and uh, here's some ideas that you can take away and, and try. Is that sort of part of what you do? Yeah, definitely. I make it individualized. I look at what they're doing and tweak things from there. In some yeah. cases, like I'm not a big fan of meal plans, but in some cases where they do really need it, I do make meal plans when they yeah. desperately need a bit of structure. But um, yeah. it's, yeah, very individualized for each person I see. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Well done, Kusha. That's great. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Kushla. We'll see you uh, again on here very, very shortly with some more great nutrition advice. I'm off to cook some chicken very shortly. <laughs> and uh, and potentially on Sunday. <laughs> and potentially on Sunday. Ah, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> uh, good. Thanks, good Kushla. Well done, Kushla. Thanks, Ed. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. Good job. Job done. How does how does the old cook once eat twice work for you? Oh, good, actually. I do that a lot. Uh, yeah, um, works really well, actually. I just need to make sure I snaffle it before anyone else does. That's a key trick. I, that's what I was sort of going for. You've got a house full of growing uh, growing kids and all, and uh, everybody there, and it uh, must be hard to get your hands on a little bit of leftover somewhere. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just try and add as many veggies to it as I can, and then they sort of mix it up a bit, and they don't touch that. That's the key thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put all the healthy stuff on on top of it, then it, it, yeah. it's safe and the good there. Well, oh, very yeah, good. Yeah. Well, Richard, that's been another great show. Now, just actually while I've got some viewers, while we've got some listeners going on there, a bit of a shameless plug for the CP Media team. We are actually on the hunt for a sponsor. We're looking for uh, someone to come on board and help us out. We've got a few projects on the go. Uh, we need a bit of investment to get us there to grow the CP Media platform and look for some better things. So if you're out there and you think you want to get involved uh, with our CP Media team and become our, become our sponsor, get a hold of us, uh, get a hold of Richard and myself, drop us a line um, through Facebook, whatever. We're interested to talk to anybody who uh, wants to help us grow this platform. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, we've got, uh, we're all about telling stories and stories of normal people out there pushing the boundaries and seeing how good they can go. Um, so yeah, it's great stuff and, and really enjoy doing that. And we've got some really awesome ideas to see if we can take that to the next level. We do. And there's lots of events going on there. We love to go to these events. We love to uh, talk to the people coming across the finish line and share their stories live as, the, as they're uh, still buzzed up and all those things. But mm -hmm. it all takes a bit of work and it all needs a bit of technology. So uh, here we are. Shout out if anybody's out there wants to get involved. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about that. Good stuff. Absolutely. And uh, if you've got... Share, us, share your learning of tonight's show. That's a really good way to summarize out some of our key points and and uh, you might have learned something from someone else or, or, or vice versa. So share that. We've got a giant bike prize pack to give away as part of that. So we'd love to be able to do that and love to give that to you next week. So even if you're listening as a podcast, you've got a week to be able to do that. Yep, that's right. So thank you all. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. However, you've listened or watched this. Uh, a huge shout out to all our sponsors uh, that do make that uh, do make all this happen currently that are partnered with Team CP who of course uh, without you Richard and Team CP we wouldn't have all these stories in this in this to tell so please do tune in next time tune in next week are we got have we got next week Rich 
that you were actually going live with uh, Waka 100, a special show next week. So that's going to be awesome. We're going to uh, jump on, take over their platform next week and talk all things Waka 100. We've got some heavy hitters uh, up there that we're going to talk to about that are going to be at the pointy end and also a couple that are just going to see if they can try and finish. So lots of learning specifically for the Waka 100 next week. Perfect. Well, until mm. next week, uh, again, thank you all for watching. Thanks to Steve, Beth, and Kushler for joining us, our guest. Richard, thanks to you for uh, for being here, sitting beside me, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Good job. Thanks, Angus.